the world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today we're joined by Charlie Olson. Charlie is the co-founder and CEO of Pando, a Series A stage fintech designing new ways for high financial variability performers to manage financial risk and upside. Pando's platform allows professional baseball players and more recently business school graduates to pool future earnings potential in ways that smooth income volatility for the group. In theory, this type of approach could help society better allocate talent against opportunities without the constraint of personal financial risk appetite. In this conversation, Charlie walks us through the model and points out some of the implications for the world. For all of our past episodes and to sign up to our newsletter, please visit bankingthefuture.com. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Charlie Olson. Charlie Olson, welcome to ReBank. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to connect. Uh, so at the time of recording, and hopefully we'll manage to push this pretty quickly, we've actually been taking advantage of the all the sheltering in place to connect with some amazing guests from around the world. But at the time of recording, you guys had a TechCrunch feature go out very recently about uh, fundraising. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and Pando and your, your guys' exciting recent news? Sure. Well, you know, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging that that was actually news that, frankly, we had been uh, sitting on for almost a year. So a year ago, when we raised our Series A, we were only pooling, and I'll get to this, but we were only pooling uh, professional baseball players. So, so those were our only clients. And press about a successful Series A in a great publication like TechCrunch would have fallen largely on deaf ears with the professional baseball community. And so we decided to wait in that one of the goals of our Series A fundraising was to launch into a customer segment, a market outside of professional sports, a market segment we were confident would be much more <laughs> receptive to the news um, and excited to interact with Pando after hearing the news about our, our successful fundraising. So I wanted to clear that up to start with. Um, <laughs> I uh, My name's Charlie Olson, as Will said. Um, I am the CEO and co-founder of Pando. We have built a marketplace to help people entering high volatility careers to come together, to find a group, and to agree to share a small portion of their future upside inside that group. Um, we call that action income pooling, and we call those groups pools. So if you hear me use those terms, that's that's what I'm referring to. Our first market was working... Uh, within sports generally, but professional baseball more specifically. And uh, in the past year, we've we've expanded to working with MBA graduates, not not NBA basketball players, but business school graduates and entrepreneurs. Um, it's been a it's been a fun ride. I actually graduated from Stanford Business School uh, almost three years ago to the day. And uh, you know, while we're young and we have a long way to go, it's been really fun to deliver a new solution to I think a. Uh, a non-novel problem, but a novel solution to uh, a, a great group of customers. All right. So, firstly, I have to clear this up. You, you kind of sound like a baseball player. Are you a baseball player? <laughs> no. But but an athlete you must be an athlete. I I <laughs> I'm a wannabe athlete. I think I peaked in baseball in seventh grade. That was right before the advent of the curveball. <laughs> um, curveball was my demise. I love I love sports. Uh, I love competing. I just am not very good at them. All right, but you are you are at least an, an MBA, so you fall into pool pool two exactly. So all right, so joking aside, and to just dig in a little bit. So 
the pooling concept. Can you give me a very tangible example of who would uh, participate in a pool and then like what would happen over time such that they would you know, receive the benefit of, of having participated? Maybe I can outline the problem first as we see it sure. and then go from there into who some good, you know, good use cases would be. So going back to the early days of Pando, I, I met my co-founder at Stanford Business School. He approached me and he had been doing research with a labor economist at Stanford. And their research suggested two really interesting macro trends. The first was that we are increasingly moving in the direction of a high volatility high uncertainty, winner take all economy. And at the same time, our generation is significantly less connected to the community based institutions, things like churches and in schools and small towns and large families, those institutions that used to catch us if we um, took a risk and we fell. And so that's kind of interesting. Our, our generation has a little bit of this double-edged sword, more career volatility and less community-based support. So Eric and I put our heads together and said, I wonder if we can create a novel financial tool for the modern economy, a tool that relies and leans on the power of community. So when we originally designed income pooling and at you know its most basic premise, income pooling again, is a group of people coming together to contractually agree to contribute a small portion of his or her future upside to the shared pool. What what does that give you? If you are, let's say, a professional baseball player and you were drafted in the first round of the MLB draft, at the time of your draft, if we look historically, you have expected future earnings of $45 million. Right? I mean, that's that's awesome. And yet, and yet, and here's the rub, a full 50% of those first round draft picks will go on to make less than $1 million in their baseball career. So you have this incredibly kind of disparate set of outcomes where half the set is earning less than a million, which means that the other half of the set has to average over $90 million right? In order for the full set to be at 45. And those players have no way to affect the odds of those outcomes. And and if you think about what life is like as a professional baseball player, I think that most of us, probably a lot of the listenership, thinks about uh, the Mike Trouts of the world, the Bryce Harpers of the world, those shiniest stars. And the reality of becoming a professional baseball player, like in other sports, is far less glamorous. Um, it, it's full of, of long bus rides, uh, bad food, but maybe more importantly, in the minor leagues, you know, a minor league baseball player is making less than $10,000 a year. That's the salary. Uh, minor league baseball players, actually baseball players generally, um, are exempt from federal minimum wage laws. And they will you know, the, the path to becoming a professional baseball player, you have to go through the minors. It takes time. And the reward, though, if you get to the majors is huge, right? I mean, Mike Trout signed a contract last offseason for over $400 million in fully guaranteed money. Okay, so you have this incredible, incredible kind of disparity of outcome where the path is hyper unclear. There's huge risks that are outside the player's control, whether it's injury risk, team politics, where you're drafted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we designed a solution for athletes to come together to agree to contribute a small portion of his earnings above a threshold. So in in the baseball model, what we've done is if and only if you make the MLB, at that point, you agree that after the first 1.5 million that you make cumulatively, you agree to contribute 10% of those incremental dollars. So if you're the first round pick and you pool with five other first round picks, you hope that you are the Mike Trout in the group, but you are also acknowledging that you might not be. And if you're not, now all of a sudden, you know, you have a cohort, you have a group, um, and you're hoping that a couple of those guys go on to do extraordinary things and you get to share in a small portion of their success. 
right? Improving the opportunity cost of pursuing this risky career uh, and making sure that you have the dignity of a secure financial future. Yeah. Okay. So the 10% basically then gets, gets paid out. And I guess, you know, the simple scenario where one out of the pool makes it, uh, the, the 10% of earnings are then what basically like distributed across the other members of the, of the pool who didn't make it. Yeah, that's right. So contributions happen annually and, uh, Pando kind of in this way acts as a pass-through entity. We are going to bring in the contributions and then uh, divvy up uh, equally based on the number of people in the pool, right? So the goal of the goal of um, the kind of Pando marketplace is to uh, group players uh, by similar expected value. So you're putting similar players with similar players, right? First round picks with first round picks, double A pitchers with double A pitchers, and that way, you know, those guys are going into this together, saying. You know, I believe in myself. I hope I am <laughs> the man. But if I'm not, uh, I'm with I'm with a bunch of other guys that I'm really excited about. And, and so at that point, kind of contributions happen annually, and Pando acts as a pass through entity with distributions happening uh, annually as well. I, I love the concept. And I know it's super early, but do you have any success stories yet, or stories of early success? Yeah, well, so, you know, a a few things that I can highlight. One, uh, we we are, we are talking in the middle of what will be the strangest baseball season, um, maybe of all time. That's tough for us. And more importantly, um, very challenging for our clients, uh, especially on the minor league side. You know, those guys are paid nine months out of the year, maximally, and, and they haven't been paid in a long, in a long while. We have clients that will clear that hurdle this season if this season is played. However, if that, that unfortunately remains to be seen um, if it's the case. But yeah, I guess our success stories uh, sit in the traction that we've had thus far. We have pulled hundreds of baseball players across uh, over 30 different pools. And uh, average pool size is 5.7 players. We have um, great talent on the platform we, we you know we have we have mlb players we have minor league players we have first round picks we have guys that went undrafted we have single a players and triple a players and every and everywhere in between and uh you know what i would what i would just say is i think that covid has been you know really an eye-opening event um especially as it relates to pando you know at, at its core income pooling helps mitigate against risk and uncertainty and it does so by leaning on the power of a group. And I think we're living through the riskiest and most uncertain event um, of many of our lives. And, and it's an event in which we are told that the best way for us to uh, be part of the solution is to be alone. And I know that has created a host of other challenges. So Pando as a product, I think, has been really well, uh, well positioned to uh, stand up in our ability to help uh, future clients mitigate against the risk of things like a uh, a global pandemic yeah well it'll be interesting to see uh, what the impact on employee whether it's baseball player or wall street uh, employee mindset is um, coming out of this experience and uh, and the relevance of pando as a result maybe quickly because i think it's su- such a crucial uh part of the conversation can you just talk about the uh the economics uh and the monetization for pando of the business model yeah absolutely so we take a portion of uh pool contributions so in some ways you can think about us as uh you know going on the ride with with these groups and uh taking a uh, portion of AUM as a fee And what I like about that model is that we are uh, motivated to create great pools that provide a lot of value uh, for our clients. And the more money that sloshes through these pools, the more money Pando makes. Uh, It it further aligns us in that we have created a uh, legal contract that is really the backbone of this contractual arrangement. And um, because our revenue uh, is derived from contributions, it means that like the other members of the pools, we are highly motivated to make sure those contributions happen and happen seamlessly. All right. So looking forward, you talked about what you've been uh, investing the Series A raise in over the past year or so, and you've just launched pooling for 
MBA graduates, I think you said. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, the long run vision of what we're trying to build is uh, a platform where anybody in any career can come to us, search for, find, or build their pool. And in order to do that, uh, we had to think about how to win narrowly. You know, I think that we, from the very beginning, uh, perceived that in order to to win more broadly and to create uh, change at significant scale, we had to choose, you know, early beachhead markets that we could tackle and succeed in. And, and, and baseball was the, was the first one. And, and we'll continue, you know, baseball, um, to our baseball clients, like we will continue to grow and build. And I expect us to be a part of the fabric of, of the game of baseball for a long time to come. I think there's also a lot of other places we could have gone next that were not <laughs> to business school students. Maybe a lot of other places that are more intuitive, for example, other sports or entertainment, uh, media, you know, and, and I'm thinking about a whole bunch of different careers in, inside of, of, of those e- ecosystems, whether it's actors, actresses, singers, songwriters, models, influencers, et cetera. And, and yet we went towards business school students. And the, the rationale for that was, I think, uh, twofold. The, the first kind of tongue in cheek here, but <laughs> Eric and I wanted to be clients. Eric and I were MBA graduates. We, from the very beginning, saw the value in uh, Pando. And, and I think, you know, from early days, we thought of Pando as much more than just a uh, diversification play. We thought about it much more than um, a way to take the, you know, career risk that we own and to spread it across a group in order to mitigate downside risk. I, I know I am the uh, probably irrationally self-confident founder when I say this, but um that was not the chief value proposition for me when I built my pool. The value prop that I was attracted to was the ability to share upside in a high octane peer group. Um, and I'm thinking about my my graduating Stanford Business School class to liver up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think and I the way I saw it, like I remember being in class so regularly listening to amazing classmates answer questions and having, you know, that imposter syndrome feeling and saying, I don't even think my brain is capable <laughs> of that thought. And, and, and so, you know, I, I recognize that, you know, there are classmates of mine who are going to go on to do extraordinary things and I would love to be along for the ride. But maybe more importantly, I also perceive that the world is not zero sum and that my path to success will not be a solo journey. And if I can surround myself with a few other individuals who are also financially motivated to see me succeed, I and my pool can create better outcomes, not only for, you know, on a kind of utility of dollar perspective, where, you know, the person who makes uh, a ton of money shares a little bit of the proceeds with the group that helped him or her get there. But in addition, I my life can be improved by surrounding myself with a great group of people who are motivated to care and to pay attention and to see me succeed. So the the reasons we've gone um, into the MBA, uh, the business school market, in many ways is to test uh, just how big Pando can be. Uh, it's a, it is a different customer segment. The, the floor looks different than the minor league baseball player. Uh, and, and on the other hand, the uh, the customer need seem salient and the same product can deliver a solution. And that's one of the things that's really interesting to us. And if we can open the door, you know, by seeing traction inside the MBA market, and we can open the door to the broader finance community, we can open the door to uh, a broader group of entrepreneurs, uh, to consultants, to lawyers, to doctors, etc. Those are massive markets and groups for, for, for which I could see pooling solutions that are really interesting, right? Whether it is taking risk off the table for the, for the person who leaves, um, you know, university of Chicago business school and goes on to become an entrepreneur and would like to pool with some folks who are in steadier careers or to the person who, uh, leaves HBS and, and goes, you know, to wall street into a, into a private equity role, uh, and, and is interested in spice in the gumbo. Uh, and, and pooling with some really hungry, talented entrepreneurs, there's a bunch of interesting ways to use pooling to uh, to satisfy different different uh, desires. Oh, th- okay, that's interesting. So it's like some sort of structured product where the Wall Street guy is like the annual cash flow that's you know in part going to 
keep the lights on for the risk takers in the pool. And then there's potential upside on, on top of that, that would accrue back to the, the wall street guy and, and the other members of the pool. If one of them hits it big in Silicon Valley. That's right. And another way to think about that is you could have a group of people with similar expected values with very different risk profiles attached to that expected value, right? The entrepreneur and the person on Wall Street might have the same expected value. But to your point, the uh, person on Wall Street expects that they are much more likely to be the cash contributor on an annual basis, uh, knowing full well that uh, the entrepreneur is also the person who is much more likely to have that really big, you know, single year exit at some point. My mind is spinning a little bit as I as I think all this through. I guess the most salient question I can come up with right now is that if I think about baseball players and I think about business school graduates, the biggest difference. Uh, perhaps is the like the expected distribution of of results uh in financial returns firstly i I guess like at least traditionally the majority of mbas have gone on to more like corporate jobs where i would expect like more consistent but uh more capped at least compared to a, a mike trout type situation whereas the results are are often binary in the in the baseball equation does that change the relevance of the model do you think from one group to another or you know perhaps this is part of the you know live in market research that you guys are doing yes there there is definitely an element um, of kind of we are learning and paying attention to you know actually what people make going into different careers and what are the volatility around those earnings And, and while i think there's an intuitive sense in the marketplace as to what you make in different in, in different career paths, that's not a data set that is uh, that is available widely. And, and, and one thing I would maybe push back on, Will, is that if you look historically at, uh, and I'll use Stanford as an example, at the graduating Stanford Business School class, the top two earners in a given class typically will earn more than the rest of the class combined. So there, there is this element that you have highlighted, I think, which, which is spot on, which is the floor is very different. But I also think the ceiling is different. Uh, for, for business school graduates, there is the potential to you know, become a billionaire. That is uh, a very, very, very rare event in sports. Uh, I think there, I don't know the exact number, but I think there might be two. I, I think it might be, you know, Maybe there's a couple, right? So it's MJ and LeBron and Tiger, who knows, maybe Michael Schumacher. I don't know, but they're few and far between, right? So th- there is still an immense amount of volatility. It's just skewed up, if that makes sense. There are more people in the, if we're looking at this and thinking about it as a normal dis- distribution, which it's not, but if we're thinking about it that way, there are more people in the middle of the curve. That's absolutely right. However, there is still the long right-hand tail. Which, which makes this still, I think, quite compelling. And one other thing to just, you know, keep in mind is that one of the reasons you go to business school um, is to lean into the power of the network and lean into the power of the community, right? It's not only to learn from your classmates, um, often because you're considering a career pivot, or um, it's, it's to accelerate your career by... Um, Surrounding yourself with great people who you think can be accretive and additive to what you're going to try to do, right? So even if you just remove the financial equation here for a second, this could also be seen as a vehicle that ties a group together and motivates a kind of cooperative, uh, collaborative board of advisors like uh, relationship that could be really beneficial for every single person in the pool regardless of what they end up making. And then another way to think about pooling is that it might increase the likelihood you have the successful outcome. Again, regardless of the, the reality that you have agreed to share a small portion of that successful outcome with this group. So it seems to me like there's an element here, which is maybe the flip side of, and I'm going to blank on the term, but basically the, the approach to, or the alternative approach to student debt 
where you're kind of like taking an equity stake in someone's educational uh, expenses in exchange for, you know, a share in earnings over uh, a period of time after graduation. This could be a bit, bit left field, but are there ways to build in other components of like the pool model, either to unlock that sort of funding, like for, for say a, a pool of would be MBA students to fund their education and potentially share upside going forward. Maybe I'll just cap it there and, and start with that question and have, have a related one after that. Sure. You know, you're, you know, you're referencing the ISA, the income sharing agreement market. Um, and that's a, that's a fascinating one that, that is, that is blossoming, um, and, and has its headwinds as well. So I think that, you know, one of the things you're, you're referencing there is, you know, can we design an equity like product that is currently satisfied by something that is a debt product, right? Literally student debt in a way where we can get cash in the hands of, you know, students or remove the need to pay because for example, a school creates a pool and because a school owns a small portion of, of their students' future earnings, you know, are they able to not charge? That, you know, that's, that's I think, a really interesting model in the long run. Um, it definitely gets us back to, towards an aligned set of incentives, right, where the school is then really motivated to produce great educational outcomes and great career outcomes because they own a portion of the outcome. We're a ways away from that. Yeah, I don't think there's I don't think there's any any way to get around <laughs> that reality. Uh, and yet, I do think there are some ways to uh, create a, you know a pool where there is cash relief in a, in a nearer term for for some individuals. So you know, one of the ways would be for as you highlighted that Wall Street individual to pool with somebody uh, maybe who's going through school at that time. One of the things, by the way, that I forgot to mention earlier that I do think is relevant to understanding the product is that like in baseball, where there, where we had that cumulative hurdle of 1.5 million, in the business product with MBA students, we also have a hurdle. It's just an annual hurdle. So, you know, whether you set it at the first uh, 50,000 or 100,000 or 250,000 dollars that you make in a given year, some amount of, of money will be protected uh, and that will be decided based on, you know, the group that comes together to pool. And so one of the things you could think about is, does that person on Wall Street, you know, pool with someone who's, you know, pursuing an MBA? Uh, that person is not likely earning income. Uh, and yet, you know, maybe they're receiving distributions at a time when their cost of capital, that debt capital is really expensive. That could be an exchange that makes a lot of sense. Uh, another way to think about that, by the way, is, you know, we have we have a host of what we call mentors on our platform who uh, you can think about them as folks that are later in their careers who have uh, already had some success and they're interested in pooling with you know, whether it's entrepreneurs or, or MBAs who are entering industries that they know well, who are earlier in their career and young and hungry and organizing some pooling relationship where they acknowledge that they are likely to be, you know, the contributor, the net contributor in the near term, while, uh, you know, yielding benefits in the long run, potentially, uh, if they're if the other folks in the pool excel and succeed. So there's a whole bunch of interesting ways that, you know, depending on what an individual is looking for, that we can design a product that can accomplish a, a number of different things. And one thing I would like to do down the road, and admittedly, this could be very, very far down the road. Uh, also, there's a chance that, you know, this is not a possibility. But one of the things I would love to do down down the road is it'd be great to be able to offer uh, the ability to buy a portion of a pool for cash. Uh, you, you highlighted the income sharing agreement model. You could think about this as the same thing. But instead of one student, it's it'd be a pool. Uh, and, and if that was the case, then that group would be able to monetize a small portion of their pool for some cash up front. And again, that could unlock, uh, that can unlock a lot of optionality and a lot of opportunity for, for those pool members and potentially ROI and, and return for the person who's investing. That's not something we currently do. Um, it's very much theoretical at, at this point. Um, 
but you know something that definitely uh, has intrigued me from the very beginning of starting Pando. All right. So in terms of more immediate steps, uh, you're launching into this new segment now. Um, what do you expect the next year or two to bring? And when should we expect the TechCrunch article with the 12-month-old news of your Series B? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me do the math. <laughs> carry the two. Um, no, it's you know it's so hard. It's so so hard to predict. I mean, I think that we are. We, look, we're, we're we're so fortunate to have raised when we did. Um, this is this is such a challenging time uh, for all businesses, and uh, we, we were we were fortunate to be in a position where we're well capitalized uh, in a business that was not hurt by COVID, and uh, you know, arguably, it's been the other way around. And so we'll see, right? Uh, the the plan originally uh, in early 2020, we were trying to launch at Haas and at the GSB with this MBA product. Uh, the thesis was, you know. Pando is based in downtown San Francisco. We could be boots on the ground. COVID had other plans for us. Um, and yet, you know, just just two, three weeks ago, we we launched and opened the platform to Wharton and to Booth. And the next kind of cohort is going to be uh, MIT Sloan, HBS, and Kellogg. So we're going to keep going, right? We're going to keep expanding. This, is, this has been really exciting for us to see the... Um, you know, kind of early excitement and early traction that we've had. I, you know, I am now a user of the Pando product, which, uh, which, which I'm <laughs> proud of. And I hope my pool mates don't mind me, you know, bragging, bragging about them, but I, I, you know, it's a group that I'm really excited about, but you know, well, from the very beginning, you know, we did not set out to build a company targeting only professional athletes or MBAs. And, and I will openly admit, MBAs are probably a group that need our product the least in many ways, right? We talked about the difference of floor, right? But one of the things that we're trying to do is to build a strong and sustainable business over time and use our success and use the revenue and, and hopefully over time profit generated to uh, drive down acquisition costs, to design an online experience that becomes much more do-it-yourself and be able to expand. Because I, I think that everyone on earth deserves the dignity of a more secure financial future. I further think that right now we are in a world where too many people are forced to make career decisions based on near-term financial requirements. So in, in essence, their career choice is dictated by their risk tolerance. And that seems to me to be a really strange way to be organizing talent, right? Rather than, for example, passion or talent, <laughs> um, dictating where we, you know, what careers we pursue. And, and what I'm hopeful that Pando can create over time is a platform for everyone where if we can help, we would like to create better outcomes where career choice and risk preference are aligned. I want to live in a world uh, that is enriched by community. And if Pando can help encourage more of those communities to come together to cooperate and, and not, only, you know, not only help in bad times, but celebrate good times, then, then I think this becomes much more than a, than a financial tool. It becomes potentially a, a business and a platform that could change the way we think about career risk and change the way we think about our own career advancement and, and, and a life and a career of meaning and purpose. Um, so that's where we're going. I know that was so high level, but if we can continue to uh, you know build great pools and then shine lights on, on the successes that we have there, and make this behavior in many ways more normalized uh, and celebrated, I think the future is very bright for us. Love it. Charlie, I wish you guys uh, all the success in the world. Very, very exciting. Potentially very powerful concept. Thank you, Will. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Charlie Olson, thank you very much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in to Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.